Hello uh, and a very good evening, everyone. Uh, welcome to EBC Learning and to today's webinar. Today, we'll be discussing a very important case, Lalita Kumari versus Government of UP. And we have with us today, uh, Ms. Pragya Parajit Singh. Pragya is an advocate at the Supreme Court of India and an adjunct professor of law at OP Jindal University. She is the founder of Pranthan Legal and has an, uh, and has an NGO called Vidhi Varenyam uh, Foundation to spread the legal literacy in the country. She has represented in some landmark cases like the Mattel Rape case at the Delhi High Court, uh, Bandhua Mukti Morcha, Pulva Param Dam case, Coal Block Allocation, Decriminalization of Begging in Delhi. She has also been a legal counsel at the Hard Jail 6 for five years. Welcome, Pragya, again at, to EBC Learning. Thank you. Thank you so much, Anjali. Glad to be back here. Thank you. And uh, we have Dr. Charu would be also be joining with us. I think most of you know Dr. Charu well, especially those who are taking our AOR at EBC. Uh, Dr. Mathur also has a rich and diverse expertise in corporate, commercial, civil, criminal, and constitutional law matters. She's an advocate on record, Supreme Court of India, and has represented parties, uh, which include cricketing bodies and educational institutions. She has authored various courses at EBC Learning. Currently, she's taking our fourth batch of AOR course, which we have started this week. We are running live classes three times a week on AOR exams. And, in, if, and if you have missed registering uh, for this batch, our next batch will start on 2nd of November. Um, I'm not sure if Dr. Charu has joined. Dr. Charu will be joining in two minutes, actually. And now I would just move it to... Yeah, Ms. Pragya, over to you with this virtual platform as well. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, you ma'am. Uh, I don't know. Kitne... Pragya, you might have to unmute yourself, please. Yeah, sure. Can you hear me now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Okay. Hello. Good evening, everybody. Just uh, give me one second. I would like to uh, share my screen. Just a second, please. Charu, ma'am, would you like to pitch in? Yeah. Hi, Pragya. Hi, ma'am. Good evening. Uh, yeah. uh, good evening to everyone. So, Pragya, you go ahead. I told you this is your show. <laughs> and I'll just pitch in if, as and when required. Sure, sure, ma'am. Sure. This is the right. most important judgment that we have to set the criminal law and uh, cr criminal courts in motion. So, you go ahead. Yeah. Sure, ma'am. Sure. Thank you so much. So, good evening, guys. I hope all of you are doing well. Uh, uh, this is my second lecture for EBC Learning, and I uh, thank uh, Ms. Anchal and uh, Dr. Charu Mathur for giving me this opportunity. And I'm also an AOR aspirant, uh, so it, in a way, uh, is helping around me as well. Uh, the case that we have at our uh, dispensa uh, dispensation today is Lalita Kumari versus State of Uttar Pradesh. I thought it would be better if I make a, a small PPT out of it because it will help us uh, gauge more with the uh, case presentation. So uh, this case uh, was filed as a writ petition, uh, numbered as 68 of 2008. So the case is actually uh, of the year 2008. Eventually, the landmark judgment uh, came in the year 2013. And this is a very important case in criminal law jurisprudence, especially because this actually uh, uh, provides observations and certain guidelines by the Supreme Court uh, on the fact that whether the power of the police uh, uh, to register an FIR, yani ki prathamik jo report hoti hai, Usko register karne ki power police ki jo hai as per CRPC section 154. Is it mandatory or is it uh, just in a way, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, indicative of the fact that they can or they may not? So we are basically going to interpret section 154 CRPC, its intersectionality with other uh, uh, provisions of the Indian constitution as uh, and uh, CRPC as well. So that is how it's, uh, it is. And uh, henceforth, I will go ahead with the case. Name of the case is Lalita Kumari versus State of Uttar Pradesh. 
Now, in this uh, particular case, this judgment came out in the year 2013, as I said, and uh, it was given by a five uh, judge bench of Supreme Court. Uh, the names are highlighted in red. Uh, Justice uh, Satar Sivam, Justice B.S. Chauhan, ju uh, Justice Ranjana Prakash Desai, Justice Ranjan Gogoi, and Justice S.A. Bobde were there. Uh, let me tell you the facts of the case very briefly, rather than venturing into what the petitioner has said or what were the contentions from the side of the respondent, it would be better that we actually focus more time on what the observations were. But to set the discourse in action, it would be better if I tell what the fact, uh, factual matrix of the case was. So there was this girl and uh, she was kidnapped uh, due to which the parents went uh, to the police station to file to lodge an FIR that uh, our daughter has been kidnapped slash abducted and we are unable to trace her. And uh, for that, they went to the police station to get an FIR lodged. Uh, the police took the complaint from them, but kept on, you know, calling them again and again on one pretext or the other and uh, hardly did, uh, did uh, do anything in this regard. Uh, they received the complaint, but they said that we are doing preliminary inquiry. And once we feel that, uh, yes, genuinely uh, your grouses are true, then only we are going to register an FIR. Uh, finally, uh, after a lot of difficulties, they, pre uh, they, they reached out to the superintendent of the police. They went to the op uh, higher authorities and uh, they listened. And uh, by the time FIR was lodged, uh, it was already quite late. Chances were that uh, the uh, evidence is tampering and all took place. And uh, police had shown a great like a dasical attitude. So the bigger question out of this entire fiasco was that whether the provisions of Section 154 CRPC are mandatory or suggestive in nature. Is it mandatory on the police to register an FIR immediately if they are told that some sort of offense has taken place, which is cognizable in nature? So I hope uh, there is utmost clarity pertaining to the topic, what is a cognizable and what is a non-cognizable offense? We are talking here about cognizable offense. And as per IPC, whatever cognizable offenses are there, they need to be converted into an FIR at the behest of the complainant. So in this very case, like I've told you what the facts were, I'm quickly going to repeat whatever is written in the PPT. So the present writ petition was filed in the Supreme Court under okay. Article 13 under Article 32 of the Constitution by Lalita Kumari Minor to her father for the issuance of a writ of hebus corpus. Hebus corpus, as you all are aware, are, there are total five types of writs. So there are five types of writs which are provided by the Indian Constitution. The writ of hebus corpus uh, basically says that where is the body or present the body. So such type of urgency was there in this matter due to which uh, the, these uh, petitioners uh, approached Supreme Court. So they uh, approached Supreme Court in the year 2012. But eventually there was a larger picture to this case due to which this matter was referred to a constitutional bench. And henceforth, this five judge bench decided to hear upon this particular case. So... Uh, the grievance of the petitioner was that, that uh, in the month of May 2008, a written report was submitted to the officer in charge of the police station, who basically did not take any action on the fact that the daughter was missing. Due to which, afterwards, an FIR was registered by the superintendent of police, uh, and yet no steps were taken for apprehending the accused or for the recovery of girl. So there has been gross misjustice in this case, sincere uh, a rather severe lackadaisical attitude was shown by uh, the police officers. If we uh, read the uh, bare uh, uh, text of section 154, there are basically three to four uh, subsections that are provided. Uh, and 154.3 clearly says that God forbid if you know, the officer in charge is denying or is taking time and not ready to uh, register an FIR, then of course the people slash complainant has the right that they can directly uh, jump the guns and they can go to the superintendent of police, precisely what happened in this very case. But despite that, they did not do anything due to which uh, gross injustice was done. So this is what the factual matrix of the case was. Eventually, the matter went uh, to Supreme Court, to the constitutional bench. Now, the constitutional bench of the Supreme Court 
called upon different uh, uh, state uh, states to file their reports in this regard. Now, before uh, reading as to what contentions were put forth by the sides of, uh, by the petitioners or by the respondents, it would be better if we read section 154 of CRPC in this regard. So 154 is, say, is using the word information. Please highlight this word. This is a very important word, especially when we are reading section 154. So it says information in cognizable cases, which basically if we you know, uh, uh, deconstruct it, it would mean that as soon as some sort of information pertaining to a cognizable case has been provided by the complainant to the police, the police must immediate, immediately come into action and they should file an FIR in this regard or first information report in this regard. Now, subsection 1 to section 154 says that every information relating to the commission of cognizable offense, if given orally to an officer in charge of the police station, shall be reduced to writing by him, which means the word shall suggest that it is mandatory in nature. And so any information that is told to a police officer orally will be reduced down in writing by these police officers under his direction and be read over to the informant. So the complainant slash informant, the one who told these information to the police orally, it will be read over to them that we are writing this down. Is it correct or not? And once this is done and every such information, whether given in writing or reduced to writing as a foreset, shall be signed by the person giving it and the substance thereof shall be entered in a book to be kept by such officer in such form as the state government may prescribe in this behalf. So uh, they're basically saying that since CRPC is a, a state subject or procedural laws are state subject, they're saying that every state may have their own rules and regulations pertaining to it. And whatever information is given by the complainant slash informant, it can be written down, reduced to writing, then it will be signed and then it will be entered into a book. Now, this is like a daily, uh, this is like a diary, which is maintained by the police. In which format it is to be written, this is basically told by the respective state government. So UP may have some other rules and policies, uh, state of Maharashtra may have something else. So depending on that, the police officer is supposed to do this. Moving on to uh, uh, subsection two, it says a copy of this information as reported under subsection one shall be given forthwith free of cost to the informant. Now, this is also a right based remedy that is provided to uh, the informant slash complainant. They're saying that whatever is recorded in this diary by the police officer concerned, they also have to provide a photocopy of the same free of cost to the one who has actually done this complaint. This is also grossly violated provision so God forbid, and if there comes a situation that you're going to the police station, everyone must know that we have to, we have the right to have a, uh, to have access to the copy of the information that is, uh, that is what we have given to the police. Now, third one is very uh, important in this regard. It says any person aggrieved by a refusal on the part of an officer in charge of a police station. So if the officer in charge, ya SHO jo hota hai, usually yaha par SHO hote hai, agar thana uh, uh, prabhari ke paas aap jayein, ya SHO ke paas jayein, aapne unko apni uh, information di, but unho ne record karne se mana kar diya. This particular section revolves around that situation. So if they deny that they're not going to record it, then what is the remedy that is available? So it says one may send the substance of such information in writing and by post to the superintendent of police concerned who, if satisfied that such information discloses the commission of an cognizable offense, shall, please underline the word shall, again, this means it is mandatory in nature, either investigate the case himself or direct an investigation to be made by any police officer subordinate to him in the manner provided by this court and such officer shall have all the powers of an officer in charge of the police station in relation to that uh, to the to that offense crux of the story cut to the chase making a summary out of what we have read in section 154 is very simple if a person has gone to lodge a complaint on the basis of that information it is mandatory upon the police officer concerned to record an FIR if it is a cognizable offense. So if it is a cognizable offense, police must register an FIR. As simple as that. Now, moving on again to the case, which is Lalita Kumari versus Union of India. So we had discussed what were the factual matrix of the case. We are coming to the issue. So, of course, issue was framed out of it. 
The issue was whether a police officer is bound to register an FIR. क्या पुलिस को बाउंड किया जा सकता है कि आपको एफ आई आर जैसे ही आपको कोई इंफॉर्मेशन मिल रही है कि ये कमीशन हुआ है कॉग्निजेबल ऑफेंस का कि आपको सेक्शन 154 में एफ आई आर मैंडेटरीली रजिस्टर करनी ही करनी है दिस वॉज वॉट द इशू वॉज इन दिस पर्टिकुलर केस और द पुलिस ऑफिसर हैज द पावर to conduct a preliminary inquiry in order to test the veracity of such information before registering the same so if this case uh, uh, is asked in nor examination first things first that you must remember in your mind is what was the issue there were two issues whether the police officer is bound to register an fir if they know the information that there is a commission of a cognizable offence second or It, is it not mandatory to register an FIR? Rather, they can go for a preliminary inquiry because you know there can be all type of informants. What if somebody is misleading these police officers? Maybe it's a a, a case of vexatious information, uh, a misrepresentation, some sort of fraud is conducted upon the police. So rather than directly registering an FIR, because the moment an FIR is launched, uh, launched. Police uh, gets into action. They start investig. Uh, they start their investigation. So they are saying rather than you know um, directly uh, filing an FIR, don't you think it would be better to conduct a preliminary inquiry so that we can at least test the veracity whether such information is correct or not? Because that is very important. We never know whether it is correct or not. So that was what the issue was in this particular case. Then of course, Supreme Court uh, made uh, several state uh, parties in this regard. Every state. came with their own sort of response in their respective counter affidavits so uh, the contention of the petitioners in this particular case were yes jyoti ji i see your hand raised please unmute yourself and ask jyoti ji were you asking something you can also write this question in the chat box i can take it up uh, uh, once i complete this all right so the contention of the petitioners were uh, of course they said that the word uh, shall has been used in uh, crpc which clearly suggests that it is mandatory in nature there is no uh, way of deviation we can't uh, uh, you know we can't let the police do a preliminary inquiry and then after uh, that they will be doing an investigation and then they may or they may not register a fir their uh, contention was pretty simple that if it's a cognizable offense police must register an fir because the what shall has been used so they are saying the word shall in section 154 one indicates that there is no discretion left to the police officer except to register the fir and in support of the same proposition reliance was placed upon the following decision uh, so there are a couple of case laws that were used here b uh, premanand versus mohan koika uh, hira lal uh, ratan lal versus state of uttar pradesh and others govind lal chagan lal patel versus agricultural produce market committee godra and others similarly they also uh, said that uh, the word the first word that was written was the information on cognizable uh, offenses so they said that mention of the word information without pre prefixing the words reasonable or credible indicates that genuineness or credibility uh, credibility of the information is not a condition precedent uh, precedent for a registration of the case so basically uh, since you all must be knowing that crpc went through a sincere overhauling over a period of years it's a very old act that was um, made by the britishers way back in the year 1873 so it has gone through overhauling many a times so in two major overhauling which was done uh, uh, as to what crpc exists today uh, they said that initially it was a discretion of the police officer that they may do a preliminary inquiry and the word shall was not very strictly used so they said that after the amendment has been made and the word shall has been used and the word information has been used we must remain fixated which basically means that if it is a cognizable offense police does not have any right to do preliminary inquiry simply file an fir that's what the petitioners said then uh, of course respondents were given chance and different states filed different replies in this regard so state of west bengal uttar pradesh rajasthan and madhya pradesh contended that the registration of fir is mandatory under section 154 of the crpc if the information discloses a cognizable offense and no preliminary inquiry is allowed in such situations so of course different states have different uh, contentions four of these states said that yes 154 should be narrowly uh, construed it's written shall so we have to abide by that word uh, let there be a prelim uh, let let uh, there be no preliminary inquiry as soon there is a commission of a cognizable offense 
police duty is to uh, register a FIR. However, the state of Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra had different uh, opinion in this regard. They said that police can do a preliminary inquiry in case they want to find out what's the truth. Because, you know, there have been gazillion cases where false information was provided. FIR was registered and based upon that FIR, police had uh, nabbed these people concerned. And later on, it was found out that they were actually not guilty. So it may be possible that people are giving wrong information. So just because it is a cognizable offense, it doesn't give the power to police to you know not register not do a preliminary inquiry of course they said that uh, the provisions of section 1541 should be read in light of certain articles which is article 14 19 and 21 right to equality right to freedom uh, and uh, right to life and personal liberty and we should you know uh, see some sort of intersectionality between these constitutional provisions and the provision of crpc they obviously said that the uh, constitution shall prevail over the, uh, the the grand norm or the constitution shall prevail over this particular CRPC. And then they're saying that uh, it should provide, uh, it provides that no citizen shall be subjected to malicious prosecution and an innocent shall not be implicated in a criminal case. So, of course, if we uh, keep in mind Article 14, 19 and 21, they Prime FSI focus a lot on personal liberties of people and it would not be correct to keep somebody behind bar or to prosecute somebody in a criminal offense if they've not even uh, committed such an offense. So just because somebody is giving information and police is filing an FIR, that's not done. That's what Chhattisgarh and Maharashtra said in this regard. They also said that no single provision of a statute can be read and interpreted in isolation, but, but the statute must be read as a whole. So they relied upon certain sections of CRPC. They said that section 41 pertaining to arrest, 57, 156, 157, 167, 190, 200, 202, of the code exist and we must not read uh, 154 in isolation. We must actually read them together and understand that injustice will be done if a correct person is sent behind bars or a, a prosecution uh, uh, takes place uh, without identifying as to what the reality was in a particular case. They also said that why are you being so fixated upon the fact that if cognizable offense, you have to do an FIR karni karni hai. They're saying that you have to get a in the code in the form of section 154.3, which says that if the police officer is not doing it, you can directly superintendent of police. Ke paas ja sakte so it's not hai that we do not have remedy. That's what they basically said. The last point that they said was, uh, was that the recording of FIR under section 154 in the book is subsequent to the entry in the general diary, which is maintained in the police station. Therefore, information is a document at the earliest in general diary. Then if any preliminary inquiry is needed, police officer conduct the same and thereafter the information is recorded at, as an FIR. So they're saying that whenever an uh, informant comes, police is of course supposed to maintain a general diary, which uh, precedes a FIR. So they're saying that police, after conducting an uh, investigation, preliminary investigation can again go back to the root and, you know, root and can go uh, look at the contents of this general diary. And if they feel that both of them are corroborating, then of course, at later stage, FIR can be registered. But petitioners were very clear that no, FIR should be registered at, as a very first step. So I hope it's clear to everyone as to what the contentions and what the uh, of both the parties were and as to what the issue in this particular case was. Now, coming to the uh, um, uh, obito dicta uh, of this particular or the ratio decidendi of this case, Supreme Court came out with certain observations which were taken uh, uh, as a landmark judgment. Um, this was eventually pronounced in the year 2013 and laid down a guideline uh, regarding uh, Section 154 registration of FIR to police officials in this regard. Now, what did Supreme Court said? So Supreme Court, after listening to both the parties, came to the conclusion that insertion of the word shall should be interpreted in a strict manner. Registration of FIR is mandatory whenever we are reading Section 154 of the court. If the information discloses that there has been a commission of cognizable offense and no preliminary inquiry is permissible in such a situation. Then if the information received does not disclose a cognizable offense, but indicates the necessity for an inquiry, a preliminary inquiry may be conducted basically to ascertain whether cognizable offense is disclosed or not. So they said that if the nature of the offense is not cognizable, then of course, police 
can uh, do a preliminary inquiry basically to ascertain whether it is cognizable offense or whether it is not. In case it is cognizable, you can convert it into an FIR. Thirdly, they said that if the inquiry discloses the commission of cognizable offense, FIR must be registered. In cases where preliminary inquiry ends in closing the complaint, a copy of the entry of such closure must be supplied to the first informant forthwith and not later than one week. Now, what they are saying is that in case uh, the police conducted a preliminary inquiry and they felt after this entire inquiry that no, this is not really a case of uh, cognizable offense and we need to put a closure to this, then they're going to make a report. They are going to provide this uh, uh, report, which is the closure report basically uh, to the informant and that shall be done within a, a, a stipulated period of one week, which is seven days. And it must disclose reasons in brief for closing the complaint and not proceeding further. So, this police has duty to say that if you think that the commission of offense was not cognizable after your preliminary inquiry, ke baad, then it is okay for them to prepare a note, close on the complaint that was uh, filed by the complainant and you have to give reasons of course that you don't to proceed further. Everything needs to be documented. You cannot just faff around and you cannot just you know, close it by telling them overly that no, no, you don't have anything to complain. That's why we are not going to proceed further. Next, Supreme Court said that the police officer cannot avoid his duty of registering offence if cognizable offence is disclosed. So if it is a cognizable offense, you cannot shrug off your responsibility. You have to register an FIR. Simple. Next, the scope of preliminary inquiries not to verify the veracity or otherwise of the information received, but only to ascertain whether the information re reveals any cognizable offense. Now, this is a very important aspect. So they are saying that police should not have that notion in their mind that while doing a preliminary inquiry, they are trying to gather information as to what happened or what not happened. They have to gather information in the direction where they are able to chart out whether it's a cognizable offense or it's not a cognizable offense. If it is a cognizable, a cognizable offense, then stop applying your mind, simply register an FIR. Uh, then they said that as to what type and in which cases preliminary inquiries to be conducted will depend on the facts and circumstances of each case. So they're saying that there are certain type of cases in which preliminary inquiry can be conducted before registering an FIR. Now, what are these types of cases? Matrimonial dispute, family dispute, commercial offenses, medical negligence cases or corruption cases. What if there's a complainant or an informant who comes to the police and says, Ji, fala fala neta ke khilaap aap, aap FIR register kariye, mujhe pata hai inhone corruption kiya hai. You are leveling charges of corruption against a person, a politician. Now, police does have the right that they can conduct the preliminary inquiry. Yes, corruption is a cognizable offense, but then we must have gravitas, we must have strong evidences to substantiate the same. So, police can conduct a inquiry in this regard whether the charges of corruption that this person is saying alleging does have any gravitas is it backed by any evidence koi aise to nahi kar raha hai koi zabardasti inse settle score uh, score settle karne ke liye to nahi bol raha hai similarly family dispute if there's a couple or a husband wife who are fighting against each other and the husband comes lodges a complaint against the wife and um, uh, 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 lodges a complaint and wants police to register an fir police should understand that the type or the nature of the offense is not criminal in nature. It is matrimonial dispute or it's a family dispute. So preliminary inquiry can be conducted. Police can actually call upon both, both the parties, ask their version, note their version. Once they know whether it's a cognizable offense or not, then only they should register an FIR. So some sort of leverage is provided in these type of cases. However, whenever it's a criminal offense and somebody can prime of a make out that it's a cognizable offense, then we should not apply our mind, simply stick by section 154 of CRPC and register an FIR. Then they're saying that cases where there is an abnormal delay, latches in initiating criminal prosecution, for example, over three months delay in reporting the matter without satisfactorily explaining the reasons for delay, the aforesaid are only illustrations and not exhaustive of all condition which may warrant preliminary inquiry. So, uh, Supreme Court also gave a sample example that uh, if there is a police station where one of the informant slash complainant comes and says to the police that a cognizable offense has taken place, please register FIR. Kar 
अब कमीशन ऑफ ऑफेंस तीन महीने से ज्यादा पहले हो चुका है छह महीने हो चुके हैं और उसके बाद ये इंसान है वहां पे पुलिस के पास कि जी आप एफ करिए प्राइम ऑफ एस आई इट लुक्स लाइक इट्स अ कॉग्नेजेबल ऑफेंस बट वाई वर यू स्लीपिंग फ्रॉम लास्ट सिक्स मंथ्स मोर देन थ्री मंथ्स हैव बीन लैब्स एंड you know now you have come so that also put some sort of question mark on the credibility of the person who has lodged a complaint even if it looks that it's a cognizable offence so in these type of cases also police can make a general diary entry uh, add all the facts that this person is saying but take it with a pinch of salt may conduct a preliminary inquiry ask them also questions that aap kyun itna de raha hai aap aap abhi tak aap kahan pe the and then eventually they can go ahead with this particular case uh, by lodging a fir if they feel that in preliminary investigation they found out that yes veracity does exist uh, then it says since the general diary station diary slash da uh, daily diary is the record of all information received in a police uh, station we direct that all information relating to cognizable offences whether resulting in registration or fir or leading to an inquiry must be mandatorily and meticulously reflected in the said diary and the decision to conduct a preliminary inquiry must also be reflected with this particular point which is point 7 point 8 supreme court is putting a lot of emphasis on the importance of this general diary slash station diary which the police station maintains now this particular diary if most of you i'm sure those who have practiced in criminal law must be knowing that maximum tampering Uh, of evidences actually takes place in this daily diaries only so daily diary is the first uh, place where whatever information is uh, taken by the complainant is recorded by the police so a lot of tweaking alterations minus plus is done in these diaries so the sanctity of this diary must be maintained is what the supreme court is saying in this particular case they are saying that whatever you are finding out you know it should be mandatorily and in the most meticulous manner be reflected in the said diary you should not do cato pito you should not do overwriting you should not leave spaces precisely what happens in the general parlance so that's what supreme court said that usual good practices should be adopted by the concerned police station so this was what the case was all about and i hope it's clear to everyone uh, if there is any question i'll be more than happy to answer Achal, ma'am. Uh, Charu, ma'am, are you here? Arun ji, I see your hands raised. You may ask me the question. Yes, my question is regarding this uh, uh, discretion of uh, conducting a preliminary inquiry. Am I audible? Yes, yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, regarding the discretion of uh, conducting preliminary inquiry, uh, uh, you have uh, mentioned several exceptions in this regard. Well, uh, like uh, medical negligence, corruption. The really ultimate uh, say is that uh, if uh, police receive in information which discloses commission of a cognizable offence in the respect of uh, say corruption, family matters, etc., then it is the discretion of the police officer. He may directly register the FIR or he may conduct a preliminary inquiry. Yes. If so, he decides to conduct a preliminary inquiry, it is not in violation of the provisions of 154. Absolutely. Okay. And uh, my second point is regarding that uh, where the information discloses a non-cognizable offence. So you said that he can conduct preliminary inquiry, and that uh, after that, if he finds there is no uh, cognizable offence, he can close. Yes, then, he can close. Uh, he it. can close. Make an entry. So my question is: If the information discloses a non-cognizable of a cognizable offence, what would be the consequence of such disclosure? Because uh, some hey. offence has been committed. Yes, that's true. So uh, you see, everything that police is doing, first of all, they are supposed to write it down. Everything has to be reduced down in writing. so when they're saying that you can uh, put a closure report as to why you do not wish to uh, uh, continue with this preliminary uh, why you do not wish to continue with the complaint that was provided by the informant it simply means that discretion has been given to the police but this discretion is not absolute you cannot operate as per your own whims and fancies if you feel that
that there exist reasons for you not to continue because you do not find gravitas in the complaint that was provided to you you may make a closure report where you have to provide reasons as to why you think the information is not enough to make it a case of cognizable offense however if it's a non cognizable offense of course there's a different procedure for that altogether but pertaining to this particular case this is this which is lalita kumari yahan pe supreme court has given discretion to police only for a couple of especially after this landmark judgment only for certain uh, types of offenses which are probably matrimonial commercial or you know case of medical negligence here only discretion has been provided otherwise they're simply saying that police is not supposed to apply their brain if it looks like it's a cognizable offense cognizable offense register an fir baat khatam simple that's all it is that's all which is there. my 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 difficulty understanding is that if so far as uh, it does not disclose after prelim inquiry a cognizable offense not registering an fir is all right and if it do not disclose any kind of offense whether cognizable non cognizable closure is all right, right. but if it discloses it if it discloses a uh, non cognizable offense then the court must have said something about that also In not because, in this particular. It it wasn't provided in this case per se, Arunji. After after hearing uh, uh, from you, uh, uh, I, what I understand is that if uh, cognizance offence is not disclosed after preliminary inquiry, just simply close it. Yes, as per this case, so, exactly. So, so, so in those cases where the non cognizance offence is found. what would happen nothing has been said on that i think if there is a uh, i mean police does not continue with it and the informant or the complainant feels that police has not done anything in this regard you do have a option of 1653 you can anyways go directly to the magistrate and you know they can take a cognizance of the same so your ways are not closed it's simply pertaining to cognizable offense in this particular case law wait but i'm not very good but uh, because Sometimes the police may say that at uh, the Supreme Court uh, ruling, I am following that. And since uh, after preliminary inquiry, no cognizable offences disclosed, I am closing it. So the thing I'm is that it anything, cannot be. Uh, I mean, it cannot be arbitrary now, since they have to provide reasons for the same. And if the party feels that you know the reasons are not justified, they have all the rights. They can directly approach to a superior court and writ. they they can challenge the same they can go directly to the magistrate they can directly go to the magistrate under 1563 also they can say that the police officials have not taken any cognizance despite the fact that we have given them complaint they have on their own found out that this is a non cognizable offense that's why they put a closure so anything and everything that police officials are doing they are circumscribed by law they can't operate Uh, out of their own free volition so just because supreme court in this particular case has said something pertaining to cognizable offense that doesn't you know give a free right to the police official to do anything and everything when it comes to non cognizable offense that's my understanding of the case but just in case if there's anybody who would want to add here i'll be more than happy to uh, learn myself uh, good evening ma'am thank you for the session uh, my question is that what is the uh, evidentiary value of the daily diary and uh, can the accused access have an access to it and if yes when see i mean it's not a, a, a matter of right that uh, the a, a, a complainant can ask for the copy of the daily diary entry usually this diary entry becomes a part of the charge sheets which are eventually uh, filed by the police officers so what they are basically saying as per this case is because i'm going to stick around this particular case only what is my understanding is that they are saying that supreme court basically said that uh, if an information has been given by the complainant which eventually culminates into an fir a free copy shall be provided to them and uh, they have the right to this particular copy so it will be provided to them when we are talking about evidentiary value of this diary it is very very important because this is the first thing uh, which eventually leads to an fir and fir which eventually leads to in detailed investigation resulting into charge sheet so the first thing is the daily diary which is maintained by the police officials so anyone who's coming to the police station if they're giving a complaint if it is registered uh, uh, and uh, a return is given it is signed it is to be entered in that daily diary so that god forbidden if something else so you know if there's a wife 
who is beaten black and blue by the husband on a daily basis eventually she files a complaint goes to the police officer and in that complaint she writes that uh, you know my husband has been trying to is been threatening to kill me and he beats me black and blue and if something happens in future my husband shall be responsible so if she is gone to police station once and she is given her complaint police is going to record it in the daily diary now uh, and will give a receiving to her obviously which can act as a, pres- a representation at a, at the future stage now uh god forbid if there comes a news to the police that this lady has been found dead they can actually take cognizance of that particular complaint which was filed by this woman uh that she has named somebody that my husband can be held responsible if i am dead so the evidentiary value of this diary is very very important so that is why they say that the sanctity of the diary should always be maintained now a lot of tampering actually takes place in these diaries uh, and this is where you know the entire ghapla is done by the police that's what my uh, minimal understanding of criminal law uh, when it comes to practice uh, has come and uh, that's why supreme court has in their observation in the end added that you know anything that you're providing in that diary you must write it in the most meticulous manner you must write reasons for everything and you should Uh, you know that's like a record that that the police officials are maintaining and that's the first information that somebody is actually collating in the form of a general diary and even after a preliminary inquiry is conducted which eventually leads to an fir this fir can also take help from the general diary entry that contains facts which are provided by the complainant so i hope it's clear yes thank you ma'am any other question anyone who has something to add please i am a struggling lawyer myself and <laughs> i am also with my limited knowledge trying to uh help whatever i can in my capacity once once you are a practicing lawyer you are always struggling because that's true sir everything <laughs> the law is so down that's true that's true sir that's true i don't think anyone can claim i am not struggling that's true sir that's true whatever is written in crpc and cpc and how it is actually practiced in the court amazes me i am like really amused at times and uh, but it's nice uh, procedural laws are nice and the overhauling that has been done over the period of years they are also nice at least on papers any other questions so i can share this ppt to abc learning and i'll give it uh, to charu mathur ma'am so that everyone can uh, use it before examination and they can quickly refresh this particular case uh if you are good to go i will hand over to anchal ji anchal ji are you here can you hear me i'm here pragya and i'm enjoying the you know the discussion and the session now it's always great to have you here with us and again a very well explained case very informative and i'm sure all the our aor experts are definitely going to be benefited with your session thanks once again and thank you all the participants see you all in another interesting session thank you very much have a great evening thank you bye bye bye